Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. My guest today is Brittany Fairweather, and we are talking about hard money lending. Brittany is the Chief Business Development Officer at TRX Capital. Brittany, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Brittany, let's start at the very basics. What is hard money lending? <laughs> uh, hard money lending is basically um, asset-based lending that is in primarily focused on um, investor transactions, and it is uh, a little bit more flexible than a traditional bank. Um, and we are focusing on properties that an institutional bank or large financial group would probably not be interested in. Um, so there's a lot of different definitions for hard money. We actually like to think of ourselves as private money. Um, so we sit somewhere in between true hard money, which is really, truly asset based um, and usually very focused on a regional uh, footprint versus um, large financial institutions and banking capital, which have a lot more um, access to capital, but a lot more restrictions. So we sit kind of in between the both. We have we have access to the institutional capital, but we also kind of have the mindset of a hard money lender where we're looking at the project um, and looking at the track record of the borrower uh, as opposed to just looking at the financial aspect. What are some of those properties that maybe a traditional bank would pass on, but you don't you don't mind investing in? So a big difference between um, Banking institutional, you know, institutional capital from a bank and a private money or a hard money lender is um, not always just the asset. So sometimes there could be a bank and a hard money loan that, you know, both would would qualify. Um, but a bank will give a lower advance rate. So they'll give a lower percentage of your total cost as a hard money lender or private money lender. We're looking at giving a higher leverage point, requiring the borrowers to come in with less equity uh, so they can scale more, they can do more transactions, and also understanding the total profitability of their portfolio as a whole. So it's not only that there's properties that banks wouldn't be interested in that we would be interested in, but it's really looking at them from a slightly different lens. So we'll give a little bit more leverage for that a bank would. Um, there are properties that we will lend on that banks will not lend on severely distressed properties where they have, you know, a lot of rehab that are, that's needed properties that have title impairments, properties that are occupied, um, maybe by a former owner, those types of properties where there's a little bit uh, more hair on them that a bank really wouldn't be interested in lending on. Those are the types of properties that we will do as well. Real estate financing can get quite creative. You know, some people are looking for loans for, for many, many years. Some people are just looking for a short term loan. Some people are looking to finance a fix and flip. What are the different types of loans you specialize in? So we focus on any property that is residential investor business purpose. So we will do a loan on a fin single fix and flip property that is six, 12, 18 months. We will do a loan on a single rental property that is a 30 year loan all the way through um, multifamily, small balance, multifamily um, that are, that is meant for residential. So we still do a, comp a component of commercial real estate as well, um, as long as it is um, residential purpose. And what is it about residential? Is that a, a niche that you decided to focus on? It's just what we know um, and what our investors are interested in. We don't really have capital for um, that's interested in uh, commercial real estate, meaning, um, you know, uh, conversions from um, hotels to residential or office complexes or retail shopping centers. Those are just not the uh, types of assets that our investors are interested in. We work with tons of other investors and I've worked with other people who have funds that are specifically set up for that type of investment. It's just not what our institute, what our capital is really interested in. Got and it. we so know residential, sounds... we started out in residential, so we can underwrite it. We're comfortable there. <laughs> Got it. So it sounds like you're doing both. You're lending out your own personal company funds as well as the funds of people who are just looking for a return, right? That's correct. Yes. We have what we call balance sheet capital um, that we've raised and then we lever that. So we have lines of credit and leverage facilities from other institutions, um, large financial institutions, private um, investors that give us additional capital to essentially lend on their behalf or lever the assets um, that we are already lending on. Got it. All right. So let's take a hypothetical example. I call you up and I say, Brittany, listen, I got this amazing project. I found this, let's say, 
I found this duplex in this really nice area. I can buy it for 200,000. It's gonna require about, I don't know, let's say $50,000 worth of rehab. But when it's done, I'm pretty sure I can, you know, it'll have a, a value of about 350,000. So there's a lot of upside here. I, you know, can you help me finance this property? What, what does that uh, discussion look like? So that discussion is twofold. So you're telling me that it's a duplex, which means you're probably going to keep it as a rental property. Most likely, most people who buy a duplex are going to keep the property as a rental property because it will be cash flowing. So I want to understand one, have you invested in that area before? I want to understand two, have you ever operated a rental property before? And I want to understand who's going to do your renovation on a duplex, especially if you haven't operated in that market before. So we really want to understand that you not only have experience with the type of property, but that you also have local resources that can help you because we do have a lot of investors who are investing from out of state. And we really want to make sure that they've had someone local in the market that can get there, bid the project, understand what the true scope of work is going to be and what that cost really is. Because ultimately, we are lending the majority of our uh, underwriting metrics are looking at not only the cost that you're going to buy the property for and you're going to put into it, but also to make sure that what you're putting into it is going to create the value that you're expecting. So if you're expecting a $350,000 ARV, we want to make sure that the property, the scope of work that you intend to do for that 50,000 is going to get you that value of 350. So that's the ba the first conversation that I'm going to have with anyone that brings a scenario like that to us is really understanding their experience, um, their local resources, and then making sure that that value really is going to be there. And then after that, we're going to we're going to want to understand the the rental income for the area. We're going to want to make sure that the property taxes are accurately estimated, that the property insurance, especially on a duplex, it's a little bit different from a single family home. Um, the property insurance is, is properly estimated and that the cost of the long-term rental loan is underwritten with accurate rates for the market so that we can make sure that that is going to cash flow. That at the end of the day, your rental income is going to cover that mortgage payment with your interest, your taxes, and your insurance to make sure that that's a strong cash flowing property. So assuming that the first part of that discussion goes very well, maybe you and I have done business before. Maybe in theory, I have a lot of other real estate investments that I've done successfully in that area. So I know the area very well. I'm using a licensed contractor. All that stuff is good on that end. On the financial end, typically, how long does the due diligence process on your end take? And how long do I have to wait as an investor before I have access to the funds? So the longest part of our process is going to be the appraisal. It's going to be that value because really that's the biggest place title as well, but really the valuation is where we put the most weight in our underwriting. So we want to make sure that we're getting the, the true and accurate, the accurate valuation, the property, what it's worth today, uh, what it's going to be worth when it's completed and what the rental income is going to be. We're going to get all three of those in our appraisal. And that's what's going to take the longest. So usually an appraisal today can take anywhere between seven to 10 days, sometimes faster, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, duplexes in, in this particular scenario, um, some appraisers have a little bit, uh, trickier time with duplexes, finding comparables. If there's a duplex that in, in an area where there's not a lot of duplexes that have been built and sold, um, then it might take a little bit longer to find the right comparables for that type of a product. Um, but really that that's, that's the bulk of the time. So especially if we've been working together, let's say we've done a couple loans together, we've already underwritten you, your track record, your credit score. We've looked at your background. Um, we understand who you are as an investor. Then we're really just looking at that asset. And so that's really the longest thing for us. We're going to get the scope of work. We're going to send that to the appraiser and we're going to say, give us your value as it sits today what it's going to be worth with this scope of work put into it and what that rental income is going to be like when it's done. And then once that's done, we're really closing in about five days, assuming everything else is in. So, you know, two weeks or so from start to finish on a repeat borrower, I will say that on repeat borrowers that have a tricky quick close that they need, we've been able to close in five days. All right. So once the evaluations are done, you got, you know, what it's worth before the, the fix up after it's fixed up, Typically, what is the equity that's required from the investor? What kind of loan to value are you willing to consider? 
So the maximum we will give on any project is up to 75% of the future value on a renovation loan. So on a fix and flip loan, we'll, we will lend up to 75% of the future value of the property, not to exceed 92 and a half to 95% of the total cost basis. So we're going to want to see that you have, you know, at the very least, five to 10% of the total cost into the transaction. Um, so usually that can work out for an experienced investor. I will say that for an experienced investor, we will do that. For new investors, that metric does scale back down accordingly. Um, so for someone who has shown a track record of being able to successfully buy and either sell or rent out these properties, we'll, we'll look at about five to 10% equity contributed by the borrower. And that usually ends up working out to be about um, a 90% of your purchase price. And then we put 100% of the holdback uh, in of the construction budget into the renovation holdback. So then you're drawing from us on on the on the work as it's completed. Amazing. What are the different types of loans that you offer? So we talked a little bit about the fix and flip loan. That's a bread and butter. We actually started our very first business in 2008, exclusively focusing on fix and flip loans for investors. Um, then we also offer uh, another type of what we call a bridge loan or an RTL loan in the institutional world, which is residential transition loan. Uh, that is, um, we also have a new construction loan as well. So we are doing ground up construction loans for investors that are either building homes to sell to retail homeowners or building homes to be rented out. So those are the two types of bridge loans that we do. And then we also do long-term loans, which are uh, for rental properties, and they are called DSCR loans, which is debt service, debt service coverage ratio. And that is just a fancy way of making sure that the income that you have expected on the property is going to cover the cost um, of the monthly cost of the property. So we do those long-term loans as well. Those are 30-year loans. Um, they are um, can be done on a single property. They can be done on a portfolio of homes. And we do those um, just about as frequently as we do the bridge loans, sometimes more frequently, depending upon where the market is and where interest rates are. And what kind of interest rates do you offer? And do the, do the rates change depending on the type of loan? Yes, rates are definitely dependent upon a loan type. Um, the lowest interest rate loans that we have are those long-term rental loans. Um, those are loans that can be sold on secondary markets. Those loans can be put into securitizations. Um, and those are more um, stringently underwritten than the bridge loans. Those rates are completely dependent upon the market and um, can be anywhere between you know, high sixes to 9%, depending upon LTV, um, and credit score. Those are really the two big drivers um, on those long-term rental loans that determine your interest rate. Um, there is also some, some movement in the interest rates on um, the DSCR. So if your property is just barely cash flowing, basically covering its expenses for you, uh, the interest rate's going to be a little higher than if you have a, a significant amount of cash flow coming in on that property monthly over your expenses. So as you start to get uh, a stronger cash flow on your project, the interest rates can go down a little bit. Um, so those are the lowest priced um, from, an in, from a cost perspective on interest rate, um, then would be the bridge loans, fix and flip bridge loans. So it's a little more risky, right? So the ri interest rates are higher because of the risk tolerance that we're taking into account. Um, there's an element of renovation to be done. There's an element where, you know, there's, you have a market where that could change and you might not be able to sell that property. So there's a little bit more risk involved. So the interest rates are a little bit higher. And then the highest price product that we have is the new construction. And that's obviously in the mind of an underwriter. It's the most risky. It's the one where, you know, we have the most capital usually extended um, and your value is really not realized until you're almost 
you know, 90% complete with that property. So there's a long risk tolerance timeline for us as a lender from the time you buy that land, from the time, you know, you have at least a structure up, right? Um, with a fix and flip loan, there's an, already an asset there. There's already a house on the property. So it's not quite as um, risky for us in, in the minds of an underwriter. On your website, it mentions that you have completed thousands of loans, you know, totaling in the billions of dollars. What does the ideal customer look like? Like when a customer comes through the door, what is the ideal customer you're looking for? So I think that is a little subjective. <laughs> Some lenders will probably say that they really want to work with uh, large investors. They've got massive operations, huge teams, everything's baked, and it's um, really plug and play. We love those investors. They're very easy for us to work with. Sometimes they can be a little bit more difficult. Um, they know what they want. They usually negotiate a little bit more. <laughs> um, and uh, that's kind of one type of investor. Um, I personally really love working with local and regional investors. Um, I love helping people expand into different products. I love helping local real estate investors really grow their local markets, um, create jobs within their local markets, create wealth opportunities for themselves and their families. Uh, so for me, as a personal preference, I really enjoy diving into local markets and working with local investors. Um, from a from a picture of a perfect investor per standpoint, um, you know, we like to see people that have reasonable credit. We don't want, we will not lend to anyone who has mortgage lates, recent mortgage lates. Um, so that's a big red flag for us right there. Um, because obviously we are a mortgage lender and we want to make sure you prioritize paying your mortgages. Um, <laughs> um, things like, you know, um, credit card things like that. Like if there's stuff in that back in the background there, those are things that we are l less concerned with. Um, people who have, um, at least a few deals under their belt are preferred just because again, from us, from a risk perspective, they're not in our minds quite as risky. We don't have to um, be as uh, conservative in our underwriting there. Um, but we work with investors who've just done their first project as well. So really the, the whole suite, but the biggest thing for us is um, doing your homework, being educated on, you know, what it's really going to take on that property. Um, and then making sure, you know, you have a history of paying your mortgages. And which regions of the country are most of your clients from? All over the place. Um, hmm. I would say that the majority of our pipeline today is um, kind of the mid-Atlantic down through the Southeast. Um, I think that's really just more than anything that's demonstrative of of where housing is needed and where people are moving um we do have a reason a pretty decent sized portfolio of clients in texas and in some of the midwest as well um, when we very first started our company the 2008 the very first lending company we were completely concentrated on the west coast because that's where we were from and that's what we knew. We knew how to underwrite assets there. We could drive every property um, and we really could like grab them and make sure we were super comfortable and confident in the project itself. Um, and as we grew and as we evolved and as we developed local relationships throughout the country, we started expanding out. And now we are um, pretty much nationwide. We do not lend in Nevada. You don't lend in Nevada. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Nevada What's has the some story there. <laughs> Nevada has some interesting laws uh, requiring brick and mortar for mortgage lenders. Um, and we just don't have a strong enough presence to have the infrastructure set up there. When we were talking about the rates, I meant to also ask you about the fees. So aside, aside from the rates that you mentioned, and you mentioned appraisal, I'm sure there's a, a fee that goes along with the appraisal. What other fees can an investor expect when they work with you? So we will have... Um, anywhere between one to 2% origination fee um, on every loan that we charge, uh, that we do. And then there's a small underwriting and processing fee. We don't like to over um, load our loans with lots of fees. The appraisal fee is paid to the appraiser. It's not paid to us. We don't make any money on it. It's completely arm's length. We have the appraiser paid and they produce their independent valuation. Um, 
And then we have some fees for processing and underwriting. A lot of that is the cost that we have to run credit, pull background checks, verify entity documents, you know, all of the things that our processing and underwriting team goes through. Um, and then there's another one or 2% on origination that we charge. That can be flexible dependent upon the interest rate as well. So what we like to really do when we talk to a new borrower is understand their business model and understand their sensitivities. So if we can understand like on this particular project that you're going to give to me, that I, I really need to maximize the cash out that I'm going to get on this property, or I really need to maximize the cash flow on this property. So if I know that up front, then I can help structure the pricing on a loan that is going to make sense and accomplish the goals that you have. So I can be a little bit flexible in how we structure the cost of the loan if I know going into it what the sensitivity is. Makes sense. You mentioned that you yourself are an investor and you have been in real estate for a long time. For somebody who is just new to this industry and maybe they're working with a lender for the first time or they're just kind of looking at their first one or two rental properties, what are some of the mistakes that you're seeing? I'm sure like out of those thousands of loans that you've uh, underwritten over the years that some of them have gone belly up. Maybe what are some of the mistakes that some of the rookies make in this business? The biggest lesson that we learned um, early on when we our very first default was that um, as an investor, you need a team. You need uh, you need people that work with you, that can support you, and that can be um, part of your infrastructure. Even if it's just a, one partner, one uh, real estate agent, however you bring in and, and structure your team. Um, very first defaulted loan we ever did was to someone who didn't have any infrastructure. Um, and unfortunately, the loan, fortunately for us, the loan was great. It actually worked out financially for us. The reason it defaulted was because our borrower passed away unexpectedly, tragically. It was horrible, but there was nobody to operate the rest of the project when he passed. And so we are not in the business of taking back loans. We do not like to make loans that we think will default. We do not want to work with borrowers who, um, who could default, right? Those are the things that we just, that's not our business. We are not a predatory lender. We do not have this just portfolio of properties where we're like, oh yeah, if that defaults, no big deal. We're just put it over on this side of the business. That's not our mindset at all. We want to empower and encourage and grow the investors that we're working with. So in that particular scenario, uh, unfortunately we did have to take the property back because there was nobody working with his team to continue the project. But because of how we underwrote it, we were able to resell it to another investor uh, and, and then at least not have you know, a financial loss on our side and we're able to, to bring a new opportunity to another investor. So we were able to, to make it work out. Um, but I think that's just a te testament to how we underwrite our properties. And so we learned we will not make loans to individuals <laughs> who don't have a backup. <laughs> Brittany, you work with investors from all over the country. What is your sense of the real estate market right now, right? And, you know, just for the record, this is like, let's say, early June of 2024 that you and I are, are talking and recording this. But what is your outlook on the real estate market going forward? I know it's kind of a, a crazy year. It's an election year. We've got high inflation. We've got rates that are maybe higher than people are used to. Where is it all going? I think it's funny when people today talk about high interest rates because when we started our auction platform, we started our first lending platform, rates were higher than they are today. Maybe property values were a little bit lower, property prices were a little bit lower, a little bit dis more discounted, so it maybe washed out. Um, but rates were much higher than they are today um, for conventional mortgages and for investment loans. So um, the market is, is totally cyclical. Um, I, I don't think, I, I personally don't think interest rates are going down anytime soon, my personal opinion. Um, I think they're going to be here where they're at for a little while. And it just means that people have to be a little bit more creative and a little bit more uh, forward thinking in their underwriting. So they have to think about the long-term hold that they're going to have on that property. They're going to have to think about ways to scale back in other areas to account for higher costs of capital. Um, and it just requires people to be a little bit more creative in, in, what, in the properties that they're looking at. Because of the higher cost of capital, we're seeing investors that are getting into different types of assets. 
to your point earlier, looking at going into duplexes where maybe they're a little bit uh, stronger cash flow long term um, because they get, you know, both sides of the house, really, literally. Um, and so we're just seeing investors get a little bit more creative, maybe going into other markets where assets are a little bit lower uh, price point. So the cost of the capital to um, borrow is not as important because ultimately when they go to hold that property long term, they'll refinance it, get their equity back out, and it'll be cash flowing. So I think we're just seeing people become more creative. And like I said, looking more at the long term uh, play understanding that the market really is is very cyclical in downturns or upswings or just normal i mean do you see a difference in in your business in the types of loans that are coming through the door or the types of projects people are involved in do you, what, what do you see like how is that reflected in the economy i think um right now the biggest change we've seen is the emphasis and the volume of new construction loans um inventory is slim. There are not a lot of foreclosures. There are not a lot of people selling their homes. There are not a lot of people moving out of their homes, um, probably because interest rates are too high for them to try and get a new mortgage. Um, but because of that, we are seeing, again, to the point of people getting, investors getting more creative, they're getting into ground up construction. They're identifying land that they can build on um, to keep their portfolios growing. So that's really the biggest difference I see right now in this market. Um, is that influx of, of ground up construction. Brittany, as we move to wrap things up here, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? So we are online at trxcapfund.com. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn or Instagram, also trxcapfund.com. Uh, I'm trxcapfund on Instagram and Brittany underscore Fairweather is where you can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn. Fantastic. Brittany, thank you very much for your time today. I really enjoyed our talk. And thanks very Thank much for so joining much. us. Have a great day. Thanks. You too.